Hi guys, it's Ted here to give you another lecture and today's lecture topic is going to be farming in the Americas and now before we begin to farm, uh, before we begin to uh, cover farming in the Americas I'd just like to do a quick recap on what we've discussed so far <clears throat> and now in our last lecture we discussed how the Paleo-Americans Paleo uh, began to thrive in the Americas without the existence of the megafauna how in the plains they developed highly specialized techniques for hunting buffalo while adapting while while adapting new techniques for survival and exploitation in their new homelands for example in the desert southwest they carefully timed their migrations to take advantage of seasonal opportunities along the pacific coast they took they did the same thing they took advantage of uh, seal um, seal rookeries, the uh, presence of both mother seals and seal pups, and also salmon runs. How in the east they simply moved into river valleys to exploit waterfowl, the abundant plant life, and then also to take advantage of deer whenever the opportunity arose. And now all of these moves, all of these uh, moves allowed them to one, uh, establish, establish social structures that were less fractious and Having social structures that were less fractious, meaning that, uh, meaning that they were able to support larger and larger groups of peoples in one location, or or at least moving together in uh, in one large group, allowed them to really just take advantage of the landscape even better, and it sort of inspired them to while they were stationary to carefully or intensively care for wild grains. While while this, while not officially farming at this point, a lot of the people did begin to adopt moves that we can cl clearly see as precursors to farming. And now farming. Uh, farming itself had the exact same effects in the Americas that it did in Eurasia and Africa. That is, it allowed for the division of labor, it, it allowed for peoples to begin to specialize their, their uh, activities. It allowed for one, one segment of the population to be solely engaged in agriculture and food production from farming. It allowed for a group of people to sort of plan the groups, the groups overall activities. It allowed for one group to be uh, used as the defense, for, uh, as, the, uh, as the key defenders for groups territories and a group settlement. It allowed for people who weren't engaged in the defense for the group's territory in hunting or in farming to be used for specialization and these specializations range from simply creating pottery for the group to creating clothing for the group to conducting uh, trade with different settlements to simply making clothing uh, and now <clears throat> and now the uh, for agriculture itself and nice farming really spread to what is now the United States from Mesoamerica and Mesoamerica is a sort of catch-all phrase for Central America and it literally means Middle America uh, but the farmers and what if now Mexico and Guatemala uh, these farmers began to exchange the techniques and the seeds for cultivating maize and beans and through that ancient trade network that we discussed in last uh, in our last lecture the, especially uh, the one that the Pueblos play such an important part of, they began to disseminate the information, the seeds, and the technology needed for maize cultivation. And the Native Americans, but before we even really get to uh, how farming impacted what would later become the continent of the United States, I just want to touch a little bit on the Native peoples, the, uh, the Native peoples and their farming. And, these, and then the Native peoples of the Americas were perhaps the most expert farmers uh, up until that point, if not ever in, uh, in human history. They went on to domesticate some of the key crops uh, that we use today, and these crops include chili peppers, tobacco, beans, maize, squash, sweet potatoes, tomatoes, and regular potatoes. And one reasoning for their very high uh, for what for their very specialized uh, farming and their very extensive farming practices is that they never domesticated large animals 
um, in in North in Mexico and in Peru, uh, at least what is now Mexico and what is now Peru, they did uh, domesticate the dogs. Chihuahuas were domesticated in, in uh, what is now Mexico, and the alpaca and llamas were domesticated in South America. But they did not domesticate large animals, and there's, there's not really a lot of large animals in America. Uh, you had jaguars, but no one's really domesticating any jaguars. You had the uh, the buffalo, but likewise, no one is domesticating the buffalo. Uh, and one reason, one one reasoning is that because you had this very lack of diversity of megafauna, that the people had to turn uh, more and more to exploiting the available plant life. That's one theory on on why they on why they became such expert farmers, why they were so great at farming. Um, and now, uh, to begin our lectures on farming in what will later become the United States, I'd like to first turn, uh, turn to the Southwest, the Desert Southwest. And farming developed in the Desert Southwest to address the slowly rising population and food concerns. And they began to cultivate maize, which was introduced from Middle America or Mesoamerica. Uh, they began to cultivate that, but they crossbred it with a very particular strain called Chapalote, and they they missed, uh, they they crossbred Chapalote with the wild Teosinte, and now Teosinte is the original source of maize of corn. Um, it's uh, it's the begin all end all if you want to say it like that of corn, and they mixed these uh, they they, they crossbred these two strains to create a very specialized hybrid strain that met the very specifics of their harsh desert environment. Um, and these people, uh, they were just beginning to farm, but already they are, they already knew what could be done. They were full aware, fully aware of what could be done with plants. Uh, and had I said it earlier, um, they, they simply never adopted it. It was simply used, in the last lecture I brought this up, they, they simply didn't use it because it really wasn't worth their time. It's a lot of hard work, a lot of effort into farming. They were getting by in their smaller groups by simply hunting and gathering and farming just it was just too much work they they could live without farming but now have populations rise has territory become more defined farming becomes more and more attractive because it allows for you to feed your populations better okay uh, and now and now had I stated earlier it was simply a dietary supplement but but around 500 BCE, a revolution occurs. Uh, farming, and particularly farming of uh, corn, zaps the soil of nutrients, uh, and particularly it, 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 it zaps the soil of nitrogen. But beans, beans replace nitrogens back into the soil. And around 500 BCE, the dietary, the dietary revolution occurs in which they begin to pair beans and maize in the southwest and has the corn or the maize zaps the soil of its nitrogens the beans release nitrogen back into the soil helping to retain its fertility okay now this led to an increase in community size as you're able to support more and more people from your from your farming from your agriculture your community size uh, grows and so forth you're able to support larger and larger peoples in that one location. And this, of course, is a very dramatic, it's a very drastic change from the way their ancestors had lived. Their ancestors had to rely on being mobile. They, had, they, uh, they lived in small groups, not because they didn't like other people or because they simply just wanted to uh, be accountable for a small group of people. They lived in small groups because they were not able to support larger groups. The uh, they, their their ability to sustain themselves and the other people in the groups relied on them being able to go to one location, gather as much plant life as they could, ingest that plant life, and use the plant life to sustain them until they met up with an animal herd, take down an animal, and then simply live off the animal herd off of that carcass for as long as they could, and then and also use the uh, the non-edible products from that from that animal carcass. Okay, but now there's a completely drastic revolution. There's more and more people in one life. They they, they no longer they no longer rely on the mobility of small groups. They <clears throat> they're now relying solely on plant life. 
and uh, and this really foreshadows the next event, uh, the the next event to come in in uh, the Southwest, which would be the Puebloan culture, the, the Pueblo peoples. But before we get to that, we first have to make a quick jump to the east, to the eastern woodland, to see how they are, to see how they're coming about with the agricultural revolution in uh, in effect in the Americas. And now maize. Maize becomes a focal point in the east, but it takes longer to gain traction because, again, people only adopt things that they need. Uh, as I stated earlier, farming is a lot of work. You have to, one, procure the seeds. You have to clear away forest if there is forest. You have to water the, pl uh, the ground. You have to plant the seeds, water the ground fend away birds and insects and any other animals that are going to come along to either eat your seed or eat your crop. You have to intensively care for your plants, for your crops. It takes a lot of your time. You have to ensure that that they're getting enough sunlight. You have to ensure that they're getting enough water. You have to make sure that the birds aren't getting to them, that rodents aren't getting to them, that wild animals in general are not coming in to take over them and you also have to be on guard for drastic changes in the weather uh, a sudden storm could wash away what you planted uh, not enough rain could doom your harvest uh, forcing you to think of uh, forcing you to invent more innovative way to make sure that your fields and your crops are watered um, it, it takes a lot uh, far farming really takes a lot and it just wasn't worth it for the people because uh, had I stated earlier in, the, in our previous lecture, they were getting by just fine off of hunting and gathering. But uh, as, as uh, the population rose, as more and more territory became restricted, settlements slash uh, permanent base camps came to be centered on river valleys and they were uh, increasingly, increasingly established adjacent to lake shores and had their territory strength these hunter-gatherer populations increasingly turned to plant foods and many and a lot of the plant foods simply went into short supply because they they were they, they weren't they, they weren't uh inten they weren't intense uh they weren't purposely put there they, they simply gathered there you know most seeds simply blow away in the wind uh so so they weren't in, in uh they weren't purposely put there, and had these food supplies uh, that most popular, the most sedentary population uh, came to rely on, had they went into sharp decline, the people simply began to plant them to uh, clear fields, to clear forests, and plant these these uh, these seeds and tend to them, so that they would be able to rely on them uh, when they came into harvest, when they came into uh, full maturity. Now. Now, uh, this food quest and this collaboration, this elaboration in, in the food quest led to the development of more complex societies. Uh, the peoples, for one, became more interdependent on each other within one community and then also with, uh, with uh, outside communities. There became uh, more reliance on the exchange of foodstuffs and luxury items. And what we begin to see develop, uh, developing is an elementary social pyramid and it develops around kin leaders and strong men uh, and now to meet these need to meet these challenges of ensuring that these food stuff will be around for the growing populations they begin to improve their storage technologies which alleviates the food shortages that they that they were previously experimenting the they began to cultivate native plants uh, to increase their supply, as I stated earlier, uh, and and they 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 intensively they begin to really cultivate these plants, uh, such as gourds and sunflowers. Uh, <clears throat> and initially, these were simply supplementing the hunter-gatherer diets, but uh, while the hunting and gathering was still preferred, farming became the preferred way of ensuring that you'd have enough food to eat throughout the year. Um, and, the, and most people, they, they lived in these uh, fertile valleys where aquatic fowl were plentiful, as I said before, had fish could be easily attained, and where gathering was still pretty simple. Um, they, 
and then farming uh farmer being adopted in some places but still not everywhere because because for most people it wasn't worth it because they didn't want all that hard labor and they were still able to they were still able to simply make it work to get by by simply gathering by simply doing what grandpa and great grandpa uh, and great grandpa were doing they, this new farming thing seemed to be something for the suckers uh, a lot of hard work you know and <clears throat> and now uh, maize and bean cultivation uh, had already been exploding in the desert southwest and good ideas travel fast as soon as the uh, results were seen in the desert southwest, it immediately spread to the east, uh, to the lands east of the Mississippi River. And now this new farming was even more intensive than the farming that, uh, that they've been resisting before. But this farming yielded better results. Uh, the corn, uh, corn is one of those miracle plants, one of those miracle crops from which you can literally uh, make about a thousand dishes from. And it didn't take long for the people east of the Mississippi to simply adopt corn and to say corn was well worth the labor. And it literally transformed their landscapes and their societies. Uh, with the now increased focus on farming instead of gathering in just about every location, the population booms. Uh, you begin to see the development of of uh, not just large villages but actually uh, small towns. And a lot of these uh, eastern, a lot of these sites east of the Mississippi, um, as agriculture became the main effort, uh, you begin to see a more organized society. They begin to organize their labor for forest clearing, uh, for <coughs> for forest clearing. Uh, you begin to see one of the negative aspects of this was the disappearance of a lot of the wild variants of of uh, particular foods uh, had they vanished in the face of more organized agriculture um, more large-scale community agriculture because in addition to uh, the transformation in the, uh, the landscape and the increase in population you had this new kin slash strong man leadership who were able to or, or who were able to marshal the people uh, sending some into forest clearing and it's really amazing because they didn't really have the iron technology to just chop down the tree and besides chopping down a tree is a lot of hard work um, you, always, you always get the you always, you always get the impression at least uh, I always do that these uh, the people were always uh, living under the motto if you're not cheating you're not trying so rather than simply spend all that time and effort cutting down the tree they will simply inflict uh, something like a mortal wound in the tree they will make the deep gashes in the trees that will cause the trees to eventually die. And when the tree died and became brittle, they will simply knock it over. So that was uh, that was their their method of forest clearing, which you know isn't a which isn't a really bad method. Um, and now these societies, uh, while they were beginning to uh, come together around strong men, and they were beginning to live a different lifestyle, they remained basically uh, they remained based on the older on the older societies on the older traditions that they that uh, existed before they came in um, and these organizations were uh, these organizations would play uh, a pivotal role in the evolution of societies east of the Mississippi um, and we'll, we'll get to those societies uh, and, and really what's uh, what's really being foreshadowed in the, the Mississippi in the lands uh, east of the Mississippi uh, will be the rise of the mound builders, the Mississippian mound builders. Uh, it was really being foreshadowed there with the introduction of farming. Uh, but one quick uh, note on farming before uh, before I move on, and that is that the only areas to remain relatively untouched by farming, these will be people who did not adopt farming in any means, would be the the plains. In which hunting uh, was still, in which the buffalo was still just central to their entire way of life, and the Arctic, and the Arctic because you're not growing anything up there. Uh, but the legacy of farming, uh, the legacy of farming, what farming allowed the uh, Paleo American to do was to form and maintain larger social groups. It led to the emergence of states. We foreshadowed the 
we foreshadowed the Pueblo and culture of the Southwest and the Mississippian mound builders uh, east of the Mississippi. Uh, it allowed them to forge states to live in to live permanently in large populations that could be easily supported by their agriculture. Uh, it allowed for the division of labor and also the specialization of jobs and tasks like defense of the group's territory and forage clearing. And these developments proved crucial to the success of uh, the Paleo-Americans. It allowed them to make that critical leap from simply mulling around and surviving to thriving and establishing themselves. And now farming, uh, as it became the main so, uh, so source of food, it changed the landscape and it changed the attitudes of people. Uh, farming no longer looked down upon had this simply hard uh, had this simply hard job that nobody wanted to do is now a highly specialized trade in the Americas and and the farming goods itself are exchanged through different groups <clears throat> and now uh, we'll break here and we'll come back and um, we'll come back uh, to discuss the Puebloan cultures and the Mississippian mound builders in our next lecture. And as always, please like, subscribe, comment. Let me know how you like this lecture. Let me know uh, what you think of the impact of farming on the Americas.